Well, welcome. My guest is um, Innocent Chukuma Ude. Um, he is the, a filmmaker. Um, one soul film is what he's known as. People who are in the creative industries, in the media, know him, know his work. You know, um, but over the past one week, a larger audience has known him for something else. Uh, from the scene of the protests at uh, the Lekki Tollgate, what many are now calling the Lekki Massacre. He was one of literally the first responders helping to take people off to safety. Um, and I'm so honored and so glad that he found the time to join me on this special NSAS series of With Judy. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So, right, first question. I mean, I, I, I know how traumatic it is to see to see, you know, injury, to see those kinds of physical traumas. How are you feeling now? Because for all of us, it's an intellectual exercise. For many of us who are not there live, it's, you know, we are intellectualizing it, we're emoting it, but you saw it. You know, how are you at this time? I'm still, still trying to find the uh, perfect or best word to describe my emotions. I, I know for a fact that uh, I feel like maybe after this period, I probably need to um, psychologically be able to myself you know, because of um, the whole mental, it's, it's a mental and emotional thing for me. I've been through a lot of emotional when I put that, you know, carrying people with blood. So, you know, it's a couple of people that died helping getting regular buses to put bodies in. Um, the ones that survive, looking up to you, and uh, like you're the only only hope they have. You know, I, 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 there, there are cases where I want to move one person to another hospital, and there are a couple of people that I need to move, but the car can probably take only two persons. They they would say, "Sir, please, I hope you're not just going to go and not come back." Because me, if I don't come back, nobody will probably show up again. I like I give you my word, I will come back, and uh, it's crazy. It's, uh, I, I don't know how I feel, um, but I I have to. I realize I need to be strong. You know, I realize I I have to do better. I have to step up to to the challenge, and. Um, Try and save life. I'm, I'm not a medical doctor. I have never seen so much sight of blood, you know, to the point where I have to carry people in my car. My car got damaged, you know, and uh, as I speak to you, my car is packed, you know, it's not working anymore. I have to fix it, you know, and then I have to go speak to a friend who drives an Uber and uh, ask him that I will pay him every day to use his Uber to move people. And I ask him how much he said, do whatever you want. It's just it's 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 um it's um it's it's, it's a devastating moment. So what exactly happened, you know, over the period? You know, and you are essentially an eyewitness. So so let me I'll just ask a few questions. Um so you were at the scene you were at the protest on Wednesday, yes. um, when the government announced the curfew, yeah. yeah? So you were already yes. at Lekki, right. and you were just another person. You were just attending these protests as you were not like behind the scenes or anything. You were just one of the protesters. Yes, I, I, I was. Um, okay, so I was at the protest ground from day one. You are the reason why Sans has a problem with us. We are not fighting for you. Yes, Do not think this fight is a license for you to keep doing your atrocities. It is time for you to change. I was actually right. as well. I was very active. Right. Um, I wasn't just a guy who was coming to be part of the crowd. I was um, taking food, drinks. Um, I brought my medical friends to keep medical support instead of your tent, checking people's BP, making sure they take care of people. Um, at some point, 
um, I realized we were having security problems. I spoke to friends who helped me raise some money with our security, more part of security personnel, like bouncers over there. A couple of times I was on that stage to give speeches and uh, encourage people on um, leadership and how to make this change that we want. The process was peaceful. The first time when in my whole life where I have seen the youth of Nigeria come together as one, religion apart, tribe apart. We were not religiously driven. We were not politically driven. We were not uh, tribally driven. In fact, we, hope we had our Muslim prayer sessions and our Christian prayer sessions. And um, whenever when the, Muslims are, the Muslims are praying, the Christians protect them. It, it was, was, was the most beautiful sight you could ever think of. And uh, we would sing, we would dance, then we would speak and talk about the situation in the country. And it was never a threat to the government. There was no defamatory statement to the government. There was no part where anybody was directly making a threat to the democratically elected government. We were not coming to overthrow any government. Nobody made a speech of such. In fact, our aim for that protest was not about the president and his administration. It was about the police system. We were trying to fix the police system. And that's what we were doing. And uh, so we were de making some demands, which has to do with increased police salary. My father is not a policeman. I don't have anybody that works in the police. So that does not directly affect me. But we feel like if we increase the police salary, because we see the condition at which they live, they live in dumps. They can't even take care of their kids. They, they, they are suffering. Uh, we want better facilities for them, better police stations, better uniforms. Don't tell the policeman to use his money to print statements for, to throw his uniforms, to buy boots. For the car, if you go to a police station, you need to make an arrest. It will take you a mobilization fee. But there's no money, money to buy for their trucks. All these were the things I know about. And I felt like when we say increase police salary, fix the police system, it made a lot of sense. Then we said the people who have died, our friends that have died, compensate their family. The compensating the family, persecute the people that have killed them. There was nobody that has been charged for anything. Persecute the people that have killed them. Then psychologically ev evaluate the mind of a policeman. I just said something to you earlier. I said, I need to go check my mental state because of my what I've seen in the last couple of days. So psychologically evaluating one's mental state, it has nothing to do with the person's crazy. It just has to do with how the person is feeling at that time, right? So psychologically evaluate the, the mind set of our security personnel to know what level are they now? Are they fit to carry those guns? Are they emotionally stable? I don't think I'm emotionally stable right now because of what I've been through in the last three days. I probably need some time off. I probably need to off this one. Then when you know the state of their mind, you can know then the, the, the shrink or whoever, the psychologist will recommend what kind of treatment the person wants. It doesn't mean the person will be totally kicked off on the force. You will say, oh, this one has been through a lot in the police. He needs two months break to go do X, Y, Z. He will be fit to work again. That's what it means to psychologically evaluate someone. And that's what we're asking. So there was nothing we were asking that was personal to us. It was just about the society. And who do we need, the, we need to do it? It's the president and the people working in the various office. So we were not, we needed them to do their job, literally. So everything was peaceful until, uh, I'm going to speak from my own perspective. Yes, so we started hearing reports of uh, how people were, situations were happening from other sides of Lagos and Nigeria, which we were not happy about. We were thinking, what exactly is going on? We realized that people are taking advantage of the protests. And uh, at the day, the, the day they announced the Operation Crocodile Smile, I told my colleagues, I said, I know the army. If the army, if the chief of army staff has said this, it means the army will make a move. They would implement. Can we pull the plug and ask for a negotiation table? So we were like, okay, let's have our last day the next day. And then we can now 
go to the negotiation table. So that day was more or less like the last day, so we can move to the next. Since the, because the governor has uh, implemented the curfew, but we were already at the protest ground when the curfew was implemented, right? So um, there's something we do every day at the protest. At four o'clock, we pay tribute to the people that have died. We sing the national anthem, and then uh, when we sing the national anthem, then we call their names after each. Uh, we call their names and we scream hero after we mention each name. And at 9 p.m. Uh, every night, we have like a candlelight service. So it's been like what we've done to honor the people that have lost their life. So when he said 4 p.m., coffee start. For us, we had a 4 p.m tribute to give so we couldn't have just walked in. then we heard the movie tonight so i remember 4 p.m there's there are videos going around 4 p.m that day i was the one who i was on the stage all the protesters were sitting on the ground i channeled or championed the national anthem i sang it i led them in the national anthem and pledge and uh, we sang the songs and everything national sang the anthem the first and second stanza where I was sitting on the stage with my colleagues and the crowd were sitting on the floor. So after that, I was thirsty. I needed water to drink. So I came down from the stage. I gave the mic to someone else, came down from the stage to go get water to drink. So while I was going to get water, to, after getting water to drink, I was feeling some level of unease in me. It's like I was feeling very hot inside. I like, I mean, the sun, maybe that's it, but I didn't feel normal. I said, maybe I needed a break. So I like, let me go sit in my car and drink the water. And my car was parked at the protest ground. So I walked away from the crowd to go sit in my car. So I sat in my car. While I was sitting in my car, fully drinking the water, my air conditioning was on. I was hungry. My friend called. I so I, I decided to drive towards Lucky Phase 1 to get food. Driving to Lucky Phase 1, almost at the runabout, a friend of mine called. And you're like, where are you? Don't go back that place. I can hear gunshots. And as soon as she said that, she hung up. She hung up and I, I just started hearing the gunshots. So I turned. I, I started seeing people running from the protest, protest ground. So please, I was already driving towards Lekki when the army arrived. So I really did, could not tell you what happened on their arrival. Because I have to speak from my own perspective, right? But I knew. While I was at Lekki, I heard the gunshot, so I turned. So I had two choices, to run away and drive and run away like the other people, or stay where I was. Uh, and then I had the third choice of going back to see what exactly was going on. So while I was driving back, I saw people running, people running. And then I asked for the hand, said the army was around. Wow, this was uh, very scary. And I started seeing people were falling were falling so i drove i i was waving my flag i opened the uh, uh, roof of my, my car it's a range over but you can still open the roof i was waving my flag for me and then i came down coming down i saw the military people as soon as they saw me they pointed their guns at me as soon as i came out of the car with my hands up they pointed their guns at me yeah like who are you i like sir my friends are there I've been hearing gunshots, I need to know what's going on. And at this point, the military has already made it, they've made a circle around these guys. A lot of people have run away, but there were still a lot of people on the ground. They've made a circle around them. Why some of their other teams were hanging around? So the ones hanging around was pointing the guns at me, why they don't want to point their guns at the crowd. But I was hearing screams and all that at the crowd. But my attention was the people pointing guns at me. I'm like, I need to help find out what's going on. They said, I should go back. Well, more like if you don't go back we will shoot so when they say go back i saw some people falling on the floor i saw a lady she wasn't in the protest she was selling stuff at the protest with her basket she was lying on the floor she's been shot on the leg and i saw another guy who's been shot on the hand those were the two victims i picked up and i threw them at the back of my car then i said i reversed and i started driving and I saw a third guy and I put him in the front seat. Then I drove out of the place, taking them to a hospital. The only mindset I have was to go to a hospital in Naja because I live around that area. 
So I went to Budo Hospital, they rejected them. I went to Government Hospital on Abraham Adesoya. He said they only take care of mother and children. And I was begging her, like, you people should just give them first aid treatment. Budo said they don't have a surgeon, but I feel I feel like whoever the doctor on seat was, he could have given them a first aid treatment because they were bleeding. Then I could now take them to a hospital. But he didn't touch them even. I went to the second hospital. He went in there, they said it was for mother and children. I'm like, can somebody just do something? Stop the blood, put a bandage. Nobody did anything. Then I drove straight to the third hospital, which is, was Doran. And Doran honestly accepted me through the emergency place and took the three of them. And I told them, please, I have more people. Can I go and bring them? They said, yes. I reversed, drove my car back to the protest ground. Now, at the point I took those people to the first hospital, I didn't know what must have happened. But at the time I came back, my guys were still circled by the military, all seated on the floor, playing the drums and still singing while I came back. The military saw me again and he said, I should go back. I said, please, I need to pick up the people who have been injured and take them with me. They said, no, I should go back. But while I was saying this, look, nobody can shut me up. I don't care, right? It's the youth have risen and we will speak the truth. And this is my truth. While I was there, while I was being stopped, I was restricted from carrying the injured. There was a military truck. There were military trucks there that were carrying people into their trucks. Now I cannot tell you if they were dead or alive. I don't know. But I know the military took some people. And I asked the officer, where are you taking them to? He said they were taking them to the military hospital. I don't know if they were dead. I don't know if they were alive because it was dark. But they would not tell me that they did not carry people from that protest. So I told the uh, military guy, now that your truck is full, there's still people there. I need to carry them. He said, no. So I was wearing my knit. I was wearing, actually wearing a native. So I took off my shirt. I took off my singlet. And I say, you have two choices. You let me carry people or you shoot me. Mm, mm, and then mm. he, cocked, he cocked his gun when I was approaching him. He cocked his gun. I said, you better shoot me because I'm not going to leave here without carrying anybody. Then another guy came to meet him and touched his chest. And he stepped back. And I walked in there and I carried the next three, four people. And I took them again to Doran. And I went back there again. At the time I was going back there, I got an ambulance where they took some people to Bodylon, the hospital in Bodylon. Uh, what's the name? And we dropped those people there. I came back. So why does people took those people to Bodylon? I used my Range Rover. I took people back again to Aja. I was just taken to Doran. And the, the, the doctor at VGC, Grandville, sent a message that he was accepting patients. So I was given, at, at, at that night of that accident, I had 13 patients at um, Doran, and I had nine patients at Grandville in VGC. All was gunshots, gunshot wounds. I had somebody at Grandville who was shot in the anus, a little boy, shot in the anus and his leg. A little yes. boy. Like a young, not like a little boy, like a young, yeah, yeah, shot in the anus. Another guy at Doran was shot in his arm, you know. So it, it was it was gunshot. It was it wasn't anything. Now when I went back that night to get more people, at that time things already already gone out of hand. The military guys had backed. Now they've left them. They're not surrounding them anymore. At the time I go back, now of the toll gates, they were standing by the Oriental Hotel section. Of the toll gates, but at this time the youths were furious. They were now breaking the toll gates, trying to because that's that, that was their own way of probably retaliating. So yes. I walked, but the military were still holding their guns. So I walked and, it, and I came back with an ambulance, which my friend sent to me. So I walked to the soldiers. I said, "Please, you guys, um, stop approaching them with force." If you approach them with force, they will keep destroying stuff. The soldier man said that I should tell them to stop 
damaging the target. If they don't stop damaging the target, they will be forced to react. So I said to him, I said, yeah, I said, sir, I don't have the power. At this point, these guys will not listen to me anymore. They would keep breaking stuff. You either leave them, or if you want to approach them with force, you will be forced to shoot more people. He now asked me, he said he didn't shoot anybody. I said, what about all the people we took to the hospital? He said, um, yeah. they were injured from the, from the destruction that we were making. I said, sir, the people I took to the hospital had bullet wounds, not glass wounds. They were bullet wounds. Bullets were brought out from them. But while we were talking, while I was having this conversation with them, the military were picking bullet shells from the target themselves. And, and I told him, I said, give me a torchlight. Let me go to the crowd and look for more people who have been hurt or injured. They didn't give me the torchlight to look for injured people, but they were using the torchlight to look for their bullet pills. Right. And they were picking their bullet pills. Right? Now, when they realized the youth would not stop breaking, and the only choice they would have was to shoot some more. And I was standing looking at them. I said, what do you want to do? And then hmm. he, somebody called somebody. Somebody called somebody among them. And he said, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And then they did like this, and they left. At the point they left, the ambulance people had to leave because they were scared. I was the only one there. And I was looking for injured people. And that was it for that night. There was something the military guy said to me. I asked him, why did you people shoot? He said, when they came, the boys were throwing stuff at them. That was why they shot. I was like, there are multiple ways you can diffuse a protest. Let's speak from the perspective. Even if they were not throwing stuff at you, why did you, even if you said you were shooting to the cloud, why did you even shoot? Somebody should ask them, why did they even shoot? Because if you want to diffuse a protest, there are two ways I know to diffuse a protest. One, you shoot the tear gas. When you drop 15, 20 tear gas in a, in, in a crowd, everybody will run. Yes. There was no tear gas sprayed. There was no tear gas. No, no, no. There was no tear gas spray. Yeah. So yeah. that was the first thing. The second thing, if you need yeah. to shoot, you will probably use a rubber bullet. Yes. There's rubber bullets. My dad was in the army. My dad is retired. So I know about the military. Was any of the military persons attacked? Where is the person? She bring up one person that was attacked. None. So the military has an answer, an answer to you. Whoever sent them there, and don't forget, prior to this, there were people that came to, to lose cameras, and, and, and for the first time, the lights went off. You understand me? No, the worst mistake the government had done was to send the military against these guys. That was the biggest mistake. And that's why we are here. The next thing, what happened at Aja, it was the boys versus the police for like five hours. The boys were shooting with the police. They were not going to back down. The police ran. I saved two police people that day. I took them into an estate and locked them there. The boys came to look for them. Now, those are not the protesters. Now, these are the thugs who have taken advantage of the situation. Aja was a no-go area. I was begging to go see the people I had at, at the hospital just to make sure they were fine. My car, my car was damaged in the process. So please, something is wrong somewhere. Whatever it is somebody is trying to cover up, it's totally, totally wrong. Why did you shoot? That's the question. Why did you shoot? Because if you want to stop the protest, you don't need to shoot unless you are going to kill. It's, 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 um, it's, it's very, and then guess what? People, I, I, I people like myself, where again, we're dealing with the mess. I, I was dealing with the mess, dealing with people, dead bodies, injured people. Okay, so the dead bodies I had 
were not dead bodies from the protest. I have to tell you that. The dead bodies I had were the dead bodies from the police and uh, the, the thugs in Ajax situation. Right. right. So why the police? Right. Yeah, I said, why, why the police um, and the thugs were shooting themselves? I was busy helping them make their way to the hospital to get themselves after shooting themselves. And some of them died. The bodies on the road. I moved. I moved them. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm in a very. Um, I'm in a very unending, un, unexplainable state. That's yeah. that's that's the truth. Yeah. But Thank that's you so much. This this narration is incredible for many people who just want to have clarity to be sure that they are not mad, that they didn't that they didn't lose their minds on on. on on the events of Wednesday. So in total, you took in total, you took how many people to the hospital? Between all your trips back and forth. Look, in, in total. I, I, I have I have I have I have helped close to 40 people in the last couple of days. Right. If not more. Yeah. Right. Close to 40 people in the last couple of days. These are people, people, people these are, are, without uh, help uh, without, uh, without, uh, without help from anybody. I have done that mm -hmm. and, and I'm very happy with myself. Right. When you when you hear when you hear when you heard the president's uh, speech to the nation yesterday. As one of the protesters that he is referring to, because you are one of the protesters that he's talking about, what did you feel about your country? What did you feel about his address? What do you feel about the protest and the response? Um, I wasn't expecting the president to come and impress me. As a matter of fact, I didn't even listen to him. Do you understand mm. me? I didn't. I, I didn't listen to him because I, I wasn't surprised about what he has to say. Am I against the president? No. Am I disappointed? Yes. Do you get where I'm coming from? Right? Do I feel like um, the only person that, that, that was really, really um, making me feel like, okay, this, this guy is, is trying to see things from our perspective or so only. But in the last couple of days, he's not been able to give us answers or give it. We would, you would not, I would, I would say, it is time to understand that you cannot sell your vote again. You cannot help these politicians steal ballot boxes. You cannot help them rig elections. If you take money from them and vote for them, you, 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 you compound your problem for another four years, and then your children, children, children will suffer for it. So this is a time where we need to start understanding that we need to come together as a team, as family, as Nigeria, get our PVC, and start considering putting the right people in the right places. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Innocent. <laughs>